really capture the longitudinal uh, helps really count, uh, capture the long, longitudinal data trends. So I decided to do a comparative analysis of about four uh, models and methods that could be used in time series from auto, auto arima to um, simple exponential smoothing space to alt linear model to the exponential smoothing space. And I did all this in the R studio and, and I was able to also forecast what would happen in the next eight years. So we're looking at 2020. Um, I hope this is legible enough, but these are my results. Um, so for example, here we can see this is the mortality. And I, I saw that for the total cancer mortality, there has been a decline from 2000 to 2020. And I know that this is kind of surprising. It was surprising for me when I was doing this research. I was like, oh, wow. So that means that we're actually doing something right. Because one of the ways, according to research, that we can see what if we're actually doing something right with cancer is a reduction in mortality. And according to research and based on research and based on my, um, based on my research, there has been a decline in mortality rate. And like I mentioned before, I was, I was analyzing about four methods and out of the four method, the best one that gave me um, the, um, the, the, my result was the alt linear uh, method. So and I, I analyzed this result based on two parameters, the MAP and RM, RM, RM Ruth uh, mean square error. And one of the reasons why I decided to do this is that MAP really helps us to know, help me to know how true is my results close to the actual results. And I want to get a MAP closer to zero. So the closer it is to zero, it means that I can trust or we can trust that this um, model, it helps to predict. And my MAP for odd linear model was about 0 0.333. And of course, my root, my root mean square error was also the least, which was at 74.59. And we can see based on this that there will be a further decline in cancer mortality rate um, for the next eight years. And this will also, if, if you can also check this result, for example, in, in the National Cancer Institute, I got like exactly, almost exactly the results um, that they got. And based on research as well, if you do, um, if you do further research, there is a, there is research say that there, there would be a further decline in cancer mortality rate. So, and this can you know, be due to several factors as well. Um, for example, for example, you know, early diagnosis, early um, management, uh, early management, so many factors that can help to attribute to the reduction. And we know that with the advent of AI, that also has an effect. And based on, I decided to do this also um, on Microsoft Excel, and it shows that lung and bronchus um, contributed to the highest death rate, followed by colon, rectum, prostate, and breast. So moving on to mortality rate. Um, incident rate, I beg your pardon. For the past 20 years, we could see that there's been a fluctuation in um, total cancer um, incident rate. So we can see that here, the highest I got here was 2007, but there's been a fluctuation in cancer in incidence rate. So for the past 20 years, it's been fluctuating, but more, more on the decline side. However, um, based on my um, analysis, um, the best model that was able to help me to predict what would happen in the next eight years um, was the exponential smoothing space. And each, if we can, based on what you can see here, you can see that there's going to be a steady increase actually in incidence rate. And a lot of factors can be due to this. One of them would be um, advancing increase in age. And for example, you see here that prostate cancer. So we see that advancing, advancing increase in age for men also will lead to that as well. And we can also see that bro lung, bronchus, breast, and colorectum, but prostate cancer um, attributed for the highest incident rate. And based on research as well, there's going to be about um, double. So there's going to be about 1.4 million increase in prostate cancer for the, ne for the next um, up, up to 2040. So we can see that although our mortality, is in, our mortality is decreasing, but there is an increase in the incidence rate. So these are further pictures. You can see that population increase, a uh, population was increasing. There was a decrease in mortality. Um, there was a decrease in mortality. And also here as well, it, based on what I was able to find for both death rate, for both mortality and incidence rates, um, the men contributed the highest um, sex or the highest gender that um, were, were um, carrying on the burden of um, death rate and incidence rate. So my conclusion is 
you know, this time series analysis really helps us to see what is crucial for healthcare. Healthcare is a major part of our economy and we cannot over, over, oversee that. So time series analysis really helps us to see crucial for healthcare. And although we can see a decline in mortality rate, but there is a projected increase in cancer incidence rates, and which means that we have to be at a continuous battle and urgency for proactive measures. So really to sustain the decline in mortality and address you know, rising incidents, um, we need to prioritize public awareness. We need to do a lot of robust screening programs, especially for our men, based on the research and based on my um, um, uh, um, results. There is need for healthy lifestyle promotion, of course. Research, investment, collaborative efforts are very much important in this season. And I believe that based on this project and together we can actually reduce the burden of cancer and ensure a healthier future for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next is Luchin. Hi. Are you ready? Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I hope it's uh, big enough for us to see. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, hello everyone. Thanks for listening to my poster presentation. And today I'll talk about, uh, this is what I'm doing. My research is the role of striatal neurovascular coupling in auditory task learning. So the brain region I'm target on is the auditory striatum. It's a specific part of brain region that receives the input from auditory cortex that relays the auditory information. And it have the output towards the downstream of basal ganglia that's related to the movement. So striatum, like it's kind of serve as a hub between the sens sensory input and the movement outcome. Like, like it kind of transfers information between these two parts. So, here, what I'm going to do is study the neurovascular coupling. So the neurons, we all know, they participate in all type of behaviors, and they're very important. Uh, on the other hand, the parallel system, which is the vasculature system in the brain regions, are also very important. They deliver the oxygen, the nutrients to the neurons and other brain cells, and also take away the metabolic waste and heat. So it's very important to study what this neurovascular coupling is actually doing during the during the learning, so that so we know in a lot of neurodegeneration disease or other neurological disease, there's actually a lot of the vasculature deficits and there's also the learning deficits. So we want to know that through this uh, type of study, we want to know what role of blood flow is actually playing in learning so that we can get some further information, probably, hopefully, to study the learning deficits in the neurodegeneration. So here I first give an introduction of the method. Uh, so here is the behavioral paradigm we use. The animal will be, it's a mouse, it will be free moving in the chamber and they will self-trigger all the free cue. It will be either low or high frequency. And then the animal will pick left or right side according to the frequency. If they did the right choice, they will have a water reward. So we can see how the animal's performance is, um, is gradually uh, improved as the animal keep trained. And uh, we are here recording the calcium uh, signal which represent the neuron activity and the blood flow velocity. Here is the calcium imaging and the registration protocol. We injected the GCAMP into the, which is a calcium indicator into the tail stratum, which is the target region. And we'll use this in Scopix camera to recording the calcium signal while the animal's moving. And then through the different learning days, we could actually register the exact same neurons through the learning stages. So we can see how these neurons are actually changing their activity through the learning. And here is our blood flow recording protocol. So this is a grain fluorescence-based protocol developed by our lab. We inject the GFP into the target region and when we, active, when we activate the green fluorescence in the neurons, this will increase the contrast in blood vessels, which make the red blood cell look dark, but the plasma look bright. And then we could plot this vessel's picture aligned to the time so we can see exactly like showing in this stripe how a plasma is moving along the selected part of the vessel. Thus, the slope of this movement track could serve as the velocity of the 
blood flow velocity. Okay, so then let's do, look at how the blood flow is actually changing through the learning. So every day we were recording the animals, uh, we were recording the animals' blood flow at the beginning of their learning. So they will have a two minute baseline in which the animal will not do any task. And then we were recording another five minutes for task while the animal is performing the task. So here we could see that if we separate the learning into four stages, which is the chance level stage, and the later learning stages until the last, which is the well-learned stage, we could actually see the blood flow is start with uh, not that much increase triggered by task at the uh, beginning stages, but as the animal reach the later stage, there is a task induced blood flow increase in the auditory stratum. And as, and as the animal keep going towards late phase, this blood flow start to drop down gradually. So this is not a linear blood flow change. So after we know what is the blood flow doing in stratum, we are doing neurovascular coupling. Then we want to know what the neuron is doing in the auditory stratum. So the majority neuron population in auditory stratum are median spiny neurons as shown here. So we are particularly interested in the D1 median spiny neurons, uh, which previous in the previous papers, we proved this group of neurons are more related to our auditory task. We then want to see how this group of neurons is actually doing during the learning. Does it show the same trend with blood flow change or a different trend? So we recorded this group of neurons during the task learning, and we could separate the neuron into different frequency preference. You know, the auditory, uh, auditory pathway-related neurons, they all have their preference, like, in, like frequencies. So we have high-frequency preferred neurons and low-frequency preferred neurons. Interestingly, we see that in the high frequency preferred neurons, the activity of the, this group of neurons are selectively potentiated during the learning. We can see as the animal keep learning into the later stages, the activity of the high frequency preferred neurons keep increase. So this is actually look more like a linear potentiation during the learning, but the blood flow we have here is a nonlinear potentiation. So how's this two going to be coupled together? So this means you're going to have to be another player between these two, between the blood flow and the D1 media spinal neuron. So here we introduced the, another group of neurons in stratum, which is the nitric oxide, the NOS1 positive interneurons. This type of interneuron we will, re, we will release nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. We want to know whether in stratum this uh, NOS1 positive interneurons could be the mediator for blood flow. So here we express the chemogenetic tool, the GQ, which could activate a specific type of neuron into the NOS1 cremise. So we can selectively activate the NOS1 positive interneurons. We see that when we activate this group of neurons, the blood flow do increase. So we could see that, okay, so the NOS positive interneurons are actually could mediate the blood flow in the auditory stratum. And then we want to know the other way. Are this group of interneurons also related to the median spiny neurons? So here we did this uh, retrograde tracing with rabies virus and also the, the double patch for the electrophysiological te test. We do see there is actually a projection from median spiny neurons to NOS positive interneurons. So now we could say that NOS positive neuro interneurons are possibly the mediator of the neurovascular coupling in auditory stratum during the task because it interacts with both the median spiny neurons and the, the blood flow. So this is basically what we have for the conclusion. So we see the the, this nonlinear <clears throat> blood flow increase during the learning and the, this uh, selective potentiation of median spinal neurons. And between these couples, the mediator could be the NOS positive interneurons because it interacts with both blood flow and median spinal neurons. So that's basically it. And I think I have uh, two minutes left in case anyone have any questions. Um, let me see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Let's move on mm -hmm. to C. 
see Seachin. And if there are is a little bit of time left at the end, we'll do some questions then. Hi, hello everyone. So I can uh I gonna share my screen. Just do one minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're going. Beautiful. Yep. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm appreciate to have the chance to share my research. So my research is called uh, the multimodal five uh, degree of freedom stretchable electromagnetic actuators holes, uh, the haptic information delivery. So I try to make that uh, because it's a poster session, so I, I try not to make it not that boring. So I, I'm gonna skip some technology details to uh, emphasize the, the application background, something like that. And I'm happy to answer any questions during this period. So as we can see here as the background, now we, we will have a lot of needs for the sophisticated uh, the haptic feedback device in the human computer interaction to improve the, tech, the tactile information delivery capability. So as you can see in the figure one, the figure one A, there's a lot of um, scenarios, for example, to the tiny, one is the telemedicine. Um, uh, for example, we can imagine if someone, they wear the prosthetics, so they lose the the sensory input, the haptic sensory input, and uh, for some navigation um, scenarios. So if they're blind, they need a lot of uh, external help to let them know, okay, so you are at the, at the crossing, so where, where, where should you go if they're the the environment is noisy, then if it will be better to have a very straightforward um, like signals to uh, to guide you to to left, to turn right, or there's a right line, you're gonna stop, or you can go straight away. And another uh, very important application scenario is is in the industrial operation. So, um, <clears throat> so right now there's some like, um, practice environment or the uh, remote control if you want to control a robot hand something like that um, it's it will be better you have some haptic uh, information can give you some feedback from the the remote end or from the robot hand end to the human end so this is the background of this in the of this uh, research, but existing haptic device, the lack of efficiency and accuracy and immerse uh, the immersive experience due to their rigid and bulky, the, the bulky uh, components. For example, there's even if someone you um, follow the Manta, they, they develop uh, haptic gloves, something like that, but, but all of them are very bulky and uh, uh, most of them, they use hydraulic or pneumatic uh, actuation method. The units uh, of very big supply, um, the, power, the, the supply uh, device, and uh, you don't want to wear that for a long time or something like that. So based on this, uh, uh, based on this background, we developed a very small and very tiny, very light device they can, it can provide uh, three modes of motion. Uh, one is the Z axis, there's the, the pressure mode, and one is it, it can like provide some angular mo uh, the motion to give you some um, angular uh, shear information. If this is the second mode, and the third mode is it can move uh, in a, it can show a linear movement and give you some skin stretch um, sensation. So you can see in this picture, we can see it is it can be bendable and it can be stretchable. And it can, uh, based, based on this attaching layer, is a uh, self-adhesive layer. So you can easily put it on your uh, waist or on your finger. It's very small. So it's uh, it can like provide a very comfortable, very uh, the very experience. 
So the I so the mechanism of this is we if when the current pass through the these coils, the the coils can generate the magnetic field that enable um the multimodal actuation of the soft magnet. So based on the bell savitt law and uh, some equations, the the soft magnet could be actuated with different motions based on the current directions with different current directions and applied to the energized coil and uh, based on the different uh, relative position of the soft magnet to the energized coil, then it can show the normal mode, the shear mode, the dragging mode. And these are the some details of the this mechanism. So based on these mechanisms, we can achieve the three model, three model, which means the normal mode, the shear mode, the dragging mode, and the five degree of freedom. So it can move the axis, can rotate or, or, around the x and the y axis, and this can also provide a linear motion along the axis uh, and the y axis, and it. Uh, it could be a stretchable haptic interface render renders rich haptic sensations. For example, the normal folds, the vibration, the angular folds, and the skin skin drag dragging in only one single device. So it can comprehensive delivery the of tactile information through the excitation of multiple uh the skin skin mechanism uh, the mechanical receptors. And it's, it is uh, compact and lightweight and the skin like softness and could be stretchable and that enables uh, uh, the comfortable skin contact. So here at the end, we uh, conduct three proof conception demonstrations that can illustrate the potential of the reported multimodal haptic devices for advanced um, haptic interactions cross recognition of different um, working status and different angular information, and we can like uh, deliver different navigations in our, uh, the signals uh, based on these three application scenarios. So you can see in details here we have single typing, the low frequency typing, the high frequency uh, high frequency vibration to show. Uh, the star working status, the normal status, and oh, if there's some emergency happens, uh, we can use a very high frequency vibrations. And you can see the the recognition accuracy is quite high. And for the second, uh, for deliver the angular information, we we can have it rotate along uh x and uh, y uh, the y axis, and also. Well, we we achieved a uh, quality of the high recognition accuracy, and for the navigation application scenario, we can uh use diff we we combine all these three modes and to make it could um uh, do some notifications and to show oh you need to stop and oh you need to wait. There's some uh, the the magnet's gonna rotate and you're gonna go left, go right go forward or go backward based on the different uh, linear drag dragging direction. And also our mm, the recognition uh, accuracy is quite good. So basically these are all the information to make, um, to improve the current, uh, the human computer interaction and to provide a much more better tactile information delivery. So that's all what I want to present, or if there's anyone have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Well, thank you for that presentation. Thank you. If Emily is ready to go, we will continue right on and save our extra time for the end when we can ask questions of any of our presenters.
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Hudson and I'm a graduate student in the Department of Physiology at the University of Buffalo. Um, today I'll be talking about my work entitled Fibrosis Independent Myocardial Stiffening in Heart Failure. Um, Okay, so heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or half PEF is quickly becoming the most prevalent form of heart failure um, and is commonly characterized by an increase in interstitial fibrosis, a reduction in ventricular compliance, which just means the heart muscles becoming more stiff, um, this diastolic dysfunction, uh, which means that the heart has impaired active relaxation, so it can't fill properly without these elevations in pressure, which lead to other symptoms like pulmonary congestion or exercise intolerance. Um, but despite its growth and prevalence, we still don't really know a lot about the underlying pathology to the disease. Um, so it's our objective of this study to try and use our large animal model of intermittent hypertension to understand the relationship between this increase in fibrosis and a reduction in compliance or stiffness. Um, so our lab has developed this novel porcine model of repetitive pressure overload, where um, we're able to recapitulate several key um, characteristics that we see in half PEF. So, we can do this by instrumenting uh, pigs with these jugular vein catheters and we connect them to these programmable infusion pumps and administer phenylephrine for two hours a day over a period of two weeks. So phenylephrine is an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist, which means that it is a vasoconstrictor and it elevates the systemic blood pressure. Um, which creates this stretch-induced injury on the heart. So when the pressure increases, the pressure in the heart increases and it creates this stretch-induced injury. So we know after you know, doing this model for a while that after this two-week period, we see an increase in fibrosis and we see this um, reduction in compliance or an increase in ventricular stiffness that's commonly seen in these HEPPEF patients, making it a great model for trying to understand this relationship in this disease. So to get at our objective for understanding the relationship between fibrosis and compliance, we did two separate studies. So in the first study, we wanted to understand how our phenotype might change if we reduce it, reduce the time of phenylephrine exposure from two hours a day over a two week period to 30 minutes a day over uh, a two week period. So within our two groups of animals, uh, we did the 30 minute group and we did the two hour group or our normal, our historical group. Um, and at the time of termination, we can construct these um, pressure volume relationships. So uh, when we derive the slope of the line between the change in pressure and volume um, at rest and during um, manipulation, like in this case, it's during PE exposure, we can construct the slope of the line and the line tells us the compliance of the ventricle. So the steeper the slope of the line, the more stiff it is. Um, so we can see here that the brief group, this blue line compared to the prolonged RPO group, this red line, the slope of the line is very similar, meaning that they have the similar, have a similar amount of reduced compliance as compared to the control, which is not very steep. So here's another way of just visualizing that data. Brief RPO, prolonged RPO have a reduced compliance or an increase in stiffness where the control animals are unaffected. So next we wanted to understand um, fibrosis and what this reduction in time of PE exposure is gonna do to fibrosis. So we did histological analysis using a picoserious red stain. So when um, this stain is applied, collagen is going to stain this bright red color. And then we can go on and quantify that and get the present collagen or an indication of total fibrosis um, in the heart of each of these animals. So 
looking at our quantification over here, we can see that the brief RPO group has a very similar amount of collagen to the control group, whereas the prolonged RPO group is significantly elevated. So this study highlights the fact that we have reduced compliance without an increase um, in interstitial fibrosis. And this is the first time that our lab has been able to dis demonstrate uh, like the dissociation between those two things. So in our next study, um, we wanted to understand if we can reverse fibrosis after it's already there, and then how is that going to change the overall ventricular compliance? Um, so for this study, we subjected animals, all the animals, to two weeks of RPO. So they're all going to have that increase in interstitial fibrosis and the increase in stiffness that we've been seeing. And then over a four-week follow-up period, they're going to receive either no treatment or a placebo um, or an oral antifibrotic drug called finerenone. So this drug has been used in other forms of disease, mainly in lung, and it's been shown to be able to reverse or reduce fibrosis, but it's never been used in the heart before. So we're gonna be able to understand A, if fibrosis can be reversed at all, and then B, how or if that can affect compliance. So following this four week treatment of uh, finerenone, we can see by constructing these pressure volume relationships, again, that the slope of those two lines are very similar between finerenone and the untreated group. So again, these two animals or these two groups have the similar reduction in compliance um, uh, between treatment and untreated. And then again, looking at fibrosis analysis through the picocerius red staining, we see that the untreated fibrosis animals have a large amount of fibrosis, but we were able to effectively reduce fibrosis in the finerenone group. So this is the first time that we were able to prove that we can A, reverse fibrosis, but reversing fibrosis does not positively impact our compliance. So despite this reduction in fibrosis, our heart chamber is still stiff. So this is um, kind of interesting findings because it's the current thought in the field that these patients have exercise intolerance because of this increased ventricular stiffness assumed to be from this increase in interstitial fibrosis. So we just proved in two different ways that you can have this increase in ventricular stiffness without fibrosis. So we can um, have reduced compliance like we saw in our first study without, the, um, without fibrosis occurring at all. And then in the second study, we can reverse the presence of fibrosis with the drug finerenone and our compliance still not be restored or positively affected. So this begs the question, what is drawing or causing this reduced compliance? Um, so for future studies, we can look at other mediators of stiffness like cytoskeletal components of the cardiomyocytes themselves. Um, or we can look at other proteins like Titan that are in the contractile units of the cardiomyocytes and mediate um, muscle contraction um, to help us identify novel therapeutics to hopefully improve these patient outcomes. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. If Yai Song is ready to go, we can get started. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Beautiful. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Yi Zong Li from Stony Brook University. Uh, my project is soft carigami robot for minimum invasive biomedical monitoring. So our project objective, uh, sorry, our project objectives is to develop magnetic soft actuators to achieve wirelessly biomedical monitoring to assist with uh, 
biosensor de delivery and uh, to achieve the biomedical uh, information delivery. So why we are interested in the magnetic soft actuators is because uh, by introduce micro magnetic particles to the polymer matrix, we can make the magnet soft and it can be actuated with the magnetic field. So it means it can be actuated wirelessly with rapid, rapid response. And uh, the most important part is that the material and the magnetic field is biocompatible with the human body. So to design our soft karigami robot, we inspired from the locomotion mechanism of the snake. So when the snake move crawl on the ground, it utilizes uh, its scale, which can be pop up when it stretch uh, its body and uh, generate an isotropic coefficient of friction so it can move forward. So we designed three kinds of uh, soft karigami robot with different pattern mimic the snake skin, which is tri triangular, trapezoidal, and circular patterns. So to fabricate our soft karigami robot, we mix uh, magnetic micro particles with uh, PDMS matrix and uh, use laser cutter to cut into our desired pattern. Then we magnetize the uh, soft actuator so that when we put a permanent magnet underneath the soft karigami robot, the pattern can be popped up to mimic the snake skin. So then we uh, investigate how can we uh, actuate the soft karigami robot to make it crawling on the ground. Uh, simply, we can uh, move a permanent magnet under the soft karigami robot forward and back backward to make it crawling. It's a very simple way so that the healthcare provider can learn it uh, very easy. And then since we care more about how to make the soft karigami robot to achieve wirelessly biomedical monitoring and assist with uh, uh, biosensor delivery. So we test the ca capacity of the soft robot. We try to different look, uh, load modes. It shows the result shows that it can carry a, uh, around 100 times of its own weight to move. Then we test the different locomotion modes of the soft karigami robot since in the human body, the contagion is very complex and we think about how, if it can move under different uh, conditions. And the results show that it can do gap crossing and vertical crawling, inverted crawling, locomotion and water. And it's also steerable, which means it can uh, turn its direction under the magnetic field, also can flip upside down. Finally, we mimic the condition in the human body uh, with a vacuous layer and it shows that it can move on such a condition. Then we test uh, the capability to do the biomedical monitoring. We choose that to monitor the gastroesophageal reflex monitoring. So we use uh, our soft karigami robot to deliver the sensor uh, on a pig esophageal and uh, it can drag the sensor to the target region and flip upside down to hold the sensor in place to achieve uh, real-time wireless monitoring. So to conclude, this project involves the uh, development of the soft karigami robot for biomedical monitoring. And uh, in the future, a minimized system that integrates actuator-enabled monitoring system with larger sensing distance for biomedical information delivery is needed. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for that. Um, let's move on to Kyle, if you are ready. Okay. 
Does that look good to everyone? That does. Cool. Thank you. All right. So thank you guys for listening. Um, so I'm in a clinical psychology program at SUNY Brockport. So a little bit less bio-based than some of the other presentations so far. Um, but the information that I'm going to be presenting today is on muscle dysmorphia, um, which is a specifier for body dysmorphic disorder, which involves a belief that one's physique is insufficiently muscular. Um, and this is commonly seen in people who attend the gym regularly um, in an attempt to improve their health and lifestyle. This diagnosis involves repetitive thoughts that include appearance comparisons and self-doubt, along with behaviors like excessive exercise and dietary restriction and monitoring. These things are typically done in an attempt to correct the perceived uh, muscular deficit. And research on muscle dysmorphia has identified various cognitive and behavioral variables that are related to other forms of psychopathology, um, such as eating disorders and addictive behaviors, or addictive disorders, excuse me, um, both of which are associated with an increased difficulty in regulating one's emotions. Um, emotional dysregulation is an absence or a deficit in the skills necessary to appropriately engage and alter negative emotional states. And prior research has theorized that both impulsivity, which is the tendency to make risky choices, and compulsivity, which involves repetitive behaviors done despite known consequences, both play a large role in a variety of behaviors and thought patterns that are associated with um, emotional dysregulation. So we thought that this might suggest that these variables are present alongside muscle dysmorphia as well. Um, with that being said, the aim of the current study was to investigate the degree to which emotional dysregulation through the mediating effects of impulsivity and compulsivity influence an individual's risk towards muscle dysmorphia symptoms. Um, mediation involves the explanation of the underlying variables that act to associate a predictor and an outcome variable, which in this case we can see down here is between emotional dysregulation as the predictor and muscle dysmorphia symptomatology as the outcome variable. Um, our first hypothesis was that impulsivity would significantly mediate emotional dysregulation and muscle dysmorphia symptoms. And then our second hypothesis stated that compulsivity would also significantly mediate these variables, but with an even stronger effect. And then to identify populations that might be relevant for future research on in muscle dysmorphia, exploratory analyses assess differences between our recruitment method groups. So up in the methods section, we can see that we use three different recruitment methods for this study. SONA was with college students at Brockport. MTurk was with workers who regularly took online surveys. And then the QR code posters we posted in gyms and on social media. Overall, we had 337 adults between the ages of 18 and 71 that completed a demographic background questionnaire and four measures. First, we had the muscle dysmorphic disorder inventory, which measured the dysmorphic symptoms. The difficulties in emotional regulation scale assessed difficulties with emotional regulation. And then we had the short version of the UPPSP, which measured participants' impulsivity levels. And then the Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale modified for body dysmorphic disorder acted as our measure of compulsivity. For the mediation analysis, um, Hayes process model four was used in SPSS. And then we also ran some chi-square tests to see if there were any significant differences in the demographic variables across the three recruitment methods. Um, you can see here in the middle that the SONA group had the most women um, out of any of the other groups, which you can see in the green of that first box. There were no significant differences in the sexual orientation of our participants. But then in the box on the bottom left, we can see that SONA was also the most diverse um, with both the MTurk and the QR code groups reporting over 90% of participants being white. Um, and then in our last box, we can see that the SONA college students worked out the least um, with around 40% saying that they never worked out or only worked out one day a week, while the QR code group worked out the most with about 20% saying that they worked out six to seven days a week. And that was our hope with hosting primarily in gyms for that group. Um, down on the bottom portion, we have the results of our mediation analysis. So you can see from the pathway leading from emotional dysregulation to impulsivity, um, there is a significant and positive relationship. 
And the same goes for the pathway that leads from impulsivity to muscle dysmorphia symptoms. Um, this effect in the middle, right above impulsivity, um, indicates that there was a significant mediation effect through impulsivity with a beta of 0 0.065. Similar effects can be seen down on the bottom, which I hope you guys can see. Um, and that had a, an effect of 0 0.135 um, which is an even stronger than that, the one that is present through impulsivity. So these findings imply that increased levels of emotional dysregulation um, were associated with higher scores on our measure of impulsivity, and that these increased impulsivity scores were associated with the greater likelihood towards the thoughts and behaviors found in people experiencing muscle dysmorphia. This allowed us to confirm our first hypothesis. And then higher levels of emotional dysregulation were also associated with higher compulsivity scores, which were found to be, again, associated with an even stronger risk of muscle dysmorphia symptoms, meaning we could confirm hypothesis two as well. By expanding the understanding of an emotional dysregulation's role in the development of muscle dysmorphia, more effective preventative frameworks can be developed that focus on behavioral traits like impulsivity and compulsivity, that help facilitate the relationship between emotional dysregulation and symptoms of muscle dysmorphia. These findings expand the understanding of the ways in which impulsivity and compulsivity levels might work to both activate and reinforce the harmful thoughts and behaviors associated with a variety of similar psychopathologies as well. And then along with the chi-square test, we also ran a one-way ANOVA, which can be seen here on the right side of the screen. Um, to find any significant differences in responses on the measures between the recruitment method groups. Um, we can see that MTurk in the green scored higher on the muscle dysmorphic disorder uh, inventory, while the SONA group scored lower than the other groups. Um, on the emotional dysregulation scale, the college students scored a bit higher than the MTurk and QR code groups. Um, implying that they might have more difficulty with regulating emotions. Um, on the both the measures of impulsivity and compulsivity on the bottom portion, we can see that the MTurk group scored higher than both of the other groups as well. Because of the influence that a person's demographic background can have on a variety of psychological concepts, including both emotional dysregulation and factors of choice behavior, the type of recruitment that we use might have affected the validity of some of the reported scores, particularly those um, from the crowdsource sample. This would be the MTurk group, which displayed the largest differences from both the college students and the QR code samples, and lets it, and lends itself to err on the side of caution when using these types of resources to recruit participants. Regardless, by improving our understanding of muscle dysmorphia, we can hope to improve the treatment and prevention of a psychological disorder that skews behaviors that are initially done to create a healthier lifestyle for someone. That's all I got. Thank you, guys. Wow, that is fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Rasika, are you yes. ready to go? Yeah, you I'm are ready. Thank you. Uh, give me a second. Okay, I think I shared my screen. Yes, it looks great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. So, hi everyone. I'm Rasika Ratnayake. I'm a third year PhD student from Dr. Shamali Gunavardhana's lab in the Biological Sciences Department from University at Buffalo. So, our lab mainly focuses on axonal transport of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. So basically, neurodegenerative diseases lead to the death of neurons in our nerve system uh, over the time due to the toxic accumulation of mutated protein in our nerve system. So one of these diseases is Huntington's disease, which is the major focus in my project. So if you talk about the Huntington's disease, Huntington disease is caused by a mutations in a Huntington protein. So normally the N terminus of this protein contain 10 to 30 polyglutamine repeats, which is very normal. However, if it's re contain the repeats more than 50 or 30s, more than 50s or 100s, 
it can lead to a Huntington's disease. The exact biological role of Huntington protein is not, not completely understood, but it acts as a scaffolding protein for various cellular processes taking place inside our neurons. Its activity can be modified by different types of post-translation modifications, including posporylation. So multiple putate putative posporylation sites of Huntington and corresponding enzymes have been predicted, but most of them haven't been biologically identified yet. So this tiny piece of project aims to prove the posporylation of Huntington by two major kinases called GSK3 beta and ERK, and also to demonstrate how Huntington posporylation is elevated under the disease condition compared to normal. Therefore, today's presentation is titled as GSK3 beta and ERK kinase can posporylate the Huntington disease protein Huntington. So when talking about the previous research in our lab used mass spectrophotometry to analyze light membrane fractions isolated from cultured neurons revealed that pathogenic Huntington can alter the proteome and genome of neuronal proteins. Further analysis identified GSK3 beta and ERK as the top affected kinases by Huntington's disease. Therefore, our main aim of this project was to isolate the function of ERK and GSK3 beta on Huntington's. As kinases, we predicted that ERK and GSK3 beta can posporylate Huntington as suggested by previous studies. To investigate this, we designed our experiments based on three major predictions. Our first prediction here is, we predicted that GSK3 beta can posporylate Huntington. So by adding GSK3 beta inhibitors, we expected to see inhibit Huntington posporylation. Our next major target of Huntington posporylation was the ERK. Therefore, our next prediction was that ERK posporylate Huntington. So to test this and confirm, we use inhibitors against ERK. As Huntington has multiple posporylation sites, we tested the extent of Huntington posporylation by ERK and GSK3 beta to test the extent of Huntington posporylation by using both two different enzymes, we use different combinations of inhibitors. So here we used human fibroblast collected from Huntington's disease patients and healthy individuals. Then we differentiate that into neurons and then we isolate the light membrane fractions by density gradient centrifugation. Next, the Huntington protein and associated proteins were isolated by using immunoprecipitation, and then those immunoprecipitated Huntington protein and protein complexes were analyzed by using kinase assay. So here are the results for our GSK3 beta kinase assay experiment. The kinase assay is an in vitro experiment performed with active kinases to identify the posporylation of our target proteins. So in here, the our target protein was Huntington and we used GSK3 beta and ERK as active kinases. And to visualize the posporylation of those proteins, we used radio level ATP in our reaction mixtures. So here our results showed that GSK3 beta can posporylate both normal and pathogenic form of Huntington protein. With the presence of inhibitor, the posporylation levels are significantly reduced, which confirms that the Huntington can be posporylated by GSK3 beta, and the Huntington is largely posporylated. The pathogenic form of Huntington is largely posporylated by GSK3 beta when compared to the wild type. So our next step was to identify the posporylation of ERK, Huntington by ERK. To test the posporylation of Huntington by ERK, we performed kinase assay using ERK. The results 
also showed that both normal and pathogenic form of Huntington can be posporilated by ARK. However, in the presence of the inhibitors against ARK, the posporilation is highly inhibited. When compare the wild type to pathogenic form of Huntington, the pathogenic Huntington show high level of posporilation compared to the wild type, which leads us to predict that Huntington is hypoposporilated with the presence of ERK and GSK3 beta under the disease conditions. With these two findings, it confirms that both ERK and GSK3 beta posporilate both normal and pathogenic form of Huntington's protein. Finally, we added both inhibitors together to see how significant ERK and GSK3 beta are in Huntington posporilation. We showed that with the presence of both inhibitors against GSK and 3 beta and ERK, Huntington posporilation was almost avoided, which may be because ERK and GSK3 beta are the kinases which are mainly regulate Huntington posporilation. We also tested the presence of endogenous kinase with our Huntington IP and it confirms with our Western blot analysis. And then we wanted to test the effect of those endogenous kinases on Huntington posporilation. It also followed our same observation as endogenous kinases ERK and GSK3 beta largely contribute to Huntington posporilation and with the presence of inhibitor against kinases, Huntington prosporylation was greatly reduced. With all these findings so far, we can conclude that GSK3 beta and ERK prosporylation can perform with wild type and pathogenic form of Huntington. And also it's concluded that inhibition of GSK3 beta and ERK can completely abolish Huntington prosporylation under healthy and pathogenic conditions. With these findings, we are further attempting to determine what are the posposites on Huntington that ERK and GSK3 beta can posporilate. And also we are planning to dissect the roles of these posporilation events on axonal transport using Drosophila genetics. That's it. And, and thank you very much for everyone and also giving this opportunity to me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. One thing I have to say, you folks really know how to pack it into 10 minutes or less. Thank you, yeah, I did oh, that. Oh dear. Okay, and next up, I am not certain our next presenter. Oh, yep, she did, just popped in. All right, so if, is it, I need Jesu, are you here? And if so, we'd love it if you would present. Okay, well, perhaps you will be ready to go in a minute. Let's proceed. Um, Cameron, if you are ready. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Thanks for being Johnny on the spot there. Whenever you're ready. I'm just looking for how to share my screen. There you go. Okay. 
Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Cameron Sinsmeister. I am a Master of Public Health student at Brockport. This presentation is a review of a qualitative study I conducted at the end of this past year, focusing on COVID public health recommendation ad adherence in rural communities. Uh, this was an important topic for me as I grew up in a severely rural area, and now I work in healthcare, and I'm now recognizing the disparities in health quality and access in rural communities that was not known to me at the time. For some background for the study, face masks were a widely recommended, recommended public health strategy in hopes of limiting the spread of COVID-19 in the United States. State governments instituted mandates to enforce these recommendations, but the ability to follow these mandates depended greatly on a person-to-person -person basis, with quantifiable data shown to be less likely in rural areas as opposed to urban centers. While there were initial outbreaks in densely populated city areas, continuous transmission in small rural areas indicates a lack of following guidelines on masking around others. Along with a lack of mask adherence, rural communities also lag behind others in public health recommendations like vaccines and social distancing. Rural areas need to be educated with scientifically accurate and consistent information in times of national emergencies. Rural areas were initially less impacted by COVID-19 compared to their urban counterparts. However, as the pandemic continued, rural areas began a steady climb in maintenance levels of COVID cases at disproportionate levels. This quantifiable data shows that masking was less prevalent in rural areas. There have been many examples of mask usefulness during previous respiratory and airborne illnesses, such as the H1N1 virus, where masks were found to be effective in reducing the total number of cases reported. Amid the recent COVID-19 pandemic, researchers in a Beijing study found that infected individuals and their contacts wearing masks greatly reduced the possibility of transmission to further cases. Masks were found to be useful in respect to both preventing illness in healthy people and preventing asymptomatic transmission. There are potentially many reasons as to why masks were worn with less prevalence in rural communities. Some of these include political ideology, education, COVID-19 experiences, and socioeconomic factors. The most likely group of individuals to report not wearing masks regularly are those who lived in rural areas, were younger, are male and white, have lower incomes, and have less education. In a study by USC, they found that more than three in 10 residents believe that no one can force them to wear masks as it's a violation of their personal freedoms. The same study found that compared to urban and suburban areas, rural communities were less likely to wear a mask in every situation asked. Texas A&M researchers found that rural residents were less likely to participate in seven out of eight behaviors that relate to the prevention effects of COVID-19. The grossest difference came in wearing a face mask and working from home. The Office of Rural Wisconsin stated that low adherence of mask mandates in rural areas could be attributed to the low perceived risk and a lack of believing that masks as a successful prevention tool. The goal of this research is to take an overall look at the COVID-19 pandemic and how rural areas reacted differently to urban areas when it comes to their willingness to support and participate in mask mandates and public health regulations. So the objective of this study in particular was to determine the reasons for rural populations being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. This includes the population's reasons for wearing or not wearing masks, following social distancing guidelines and vaccine adherence. The study aims to determine if there was a lack of knowledge regarding public health recommendations or if there were other beliefs and behaviors that led to this. So for this study, it was a sample consist of adults who all reported living in rural areas during the years of 2019 through 2023, which we consider the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. A non-probability sampling convenience sampling technique was used to select individuals to participate in this interview procedure. Data for this population was collected via interviews. These interviews were transcribed and put into these, a uh, couple of the questions were put into this chart. These were some of the initial beginning questions. Uh, as you can see, they all lived in rural areas and all reported knowing that the guidance from the CDC and what it meant. And then if you continue down the chart, there are further questions that asked why they were going against the direct recommendations. Thematic analysis was used in order to interrupt the, interpret the qualitative data collected. This is because of the ability to read through a set of collected data and looking for patterns in the meaning of the data to find themes. By identifying these patterns, the researcher was able to determine the main reasons for certain behaviors of participants that represent the community as a whole. 
This technique was used as opposed to content analysis for the reason of being able to understand the why behind the behaviors instead of just the frequency of these behaviors. In all the interviews, all reported living in rural areas and of the population interviewed five were between the ages of 20 to 25 and two were the age over 50. All individuals reported that they did live in rural environment during COVID-19. All responded that they were aware of the guidance given by the CDC and government associations. Regarding likelihood of wearing masks around others, more than half reported that they would wear masks if it was required in public spaces and not when it wasn't. Slightly less than half would wear masks voluntarily. Exactly half responded that they thought masks were effective in reducing transmission of COVID-19, with multiple stating that only if people wore proper material masks and wore them properly. The most common reoccurring response as to why people chose not to wear masks was due to discomfort and difficulty breathing. One participant stated, I only wore masks when everyone else was, otherwise it was difficult to breathe and talk. All but one responded that they were not influenced by other people, like family, political leaders. The main findings of the study included that individuals wore masks more likely due to requirements rather than voluntarily for their and others' health. All participants understood that recommendations were given by the CDC, but slightly more than half chose to disregard these recommendations when not forced to. Half believed that masks did help the prevent of COVID, while half believed that masks did not make a difference in the spread. Regarding the initial study objectives, these interviews clearly showed that rural populations did have an adequate understanding of what public health recommendations were put in place by the CDC and government organization. This shows that the reasons why COVID-19 affected rural populations disproportionately were not due to a lack of understanding, but something else instead. This reason from the short study can both mostly be attributed to not believing that masks prevent this COVID-19 to begin with, and that masks were uncomfortable to wear while around others. A large scale study done in 2020 found that rural Americans were 49% less likely to engage in recommended public health actions in regard to COVID-19. This is very similar to, the, to this current study where close to 50% participated in these recommendations only when forced to, and close to half believed that masks were not entirely effective. This study is important for public health in the future due to its additional findings that are very similar to existing data. The study proved again that rural populations are willingly and knowingly making decisions that go against professional public health guidance at a higher rate than most of their urban counterparts. Thank you. Thank you. And we all saw that, didn't we? All right. Uh, any, are you here? I see you. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Yay. Okay. You can share your screen whenever. All right. It's just a moment, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Inige Sitaro, and I'll be giving a presentation on the maternal on the maternal and infant mortality in pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial um, Nigeria. So I decided to do a research on this topic because I'm interested in maternal and infant mortality, and um, I wanted to try to evaluate whether or not there has been any changes 
um, during any of these eras and see how the colonial era might have impacted um, the current state of the um, maternal and infant mortality rates in Nigeria. So um, just a little bit, a little um, background. Maternal mortality refers to the loss of a woman's um, life due to complications related to pregnancy or childbirth within six weeks um, of the end of pregnancy, while infant mortality refers to the death of a child before their first um, birthday. Um, maternal mot mortality posi poses a significant um, public health challenges in low and mid income countries, especially in countries like Nigeria, because it serves as, and globally, it also serves, maternal mortality is an indicator that can be used to measure um, the health, um, the state of health of um, a country. Um, and in 2020, Nigeria recorded a maternal mortality rate of 1,047. Globally, Nigeria is the fourth country with the highest um, maternal mortality rates. And in 2021, the infant mortality um, was 57 per 8,000 live births. Like I previously mentioned, my objectives um, for this review was to examine the historical evolution and contemporary ch challenges of maternal and infant healthcare in Nigeria, and also um, evaluate the impact of the colonial era on the maternal and infant um, health services on post-colonial um, healthcare outcomes and probably propose um, strategies for how, for the improvement of maternal and infant healthcare in Nigeria. So for my methodology, I, I employed a multifaceted approach by combining historical documents to um, access the pre-colonial and the post-colonial um, information. And I also did a literature review to explain, explore the current maternal and infant healthcare in Nigeria. So for my results for pre-colonial area, do I not, I could not find like data. I could not find, um, I was not able to find like actual numbers and rates, um, but for, for info, with information that I found during for colonial era, it's reflected that um, the maternal and infant mortality in Nigeria um, was also um, bad. During this era, they, they relied a lot on traditional medicine and they served, traditional uh, medicine served as the primary method of providing healthcare in Nigeria. Um, herbalists, mental health therapists, all of these were traditional um, ELAs were all part of um, the procedures that traditional rulers and traditional um, meds, medicine physicians provided. For the colonial era, this was when this was between 1861 to 1960, 1959. Um, colonial medicine, colonial med, uh, med, medical services in 19th century in Nigeria, it was introduced by the Europeans, but their primary aim was to help the Europeans that were actually living in the country. And because of this um, primary aim, it led to segregation by race, leading to healthcare disparities. But one thing that the um, colonial masters did on um, did in Nigeria, unlike places that were ruled by the French people, they tried to incorporate, they tried to involve the um, African chiefs in healthcare planning because the African chiefs back then were like the people, they were like the people that um, other Nigerians listened to. So they tried to involve the African chiefs in the healthcare planning, and this um, improved the health outcomes, but. The Colonial Development and Welfare Act of 1940 was the one that facilitated a bigger healthcare improvement plan. This um, act included infrastructure development, healthcare worker, healthcare worker training, disease control, and maternal and child health initiatives. Also, something else that led to them actually coming up with, um, with this act was uh, the previous high number, um, high newborn mortality rates in Lagos during the 1920s. And if you look at this um, bar chart here, you can see um, this lighter shade of blue is the amount of um, births, while the darker shade of blue is the amount of deaths. If you can see, it's almost about the same. Like it's it's like every child almost um, about eighty percent in some years, and other years about seventy five percent um, of children being born were dying, and this were um, due to um, various um, reasons. And that was one of the things that prompted the development of the um, Colonial and Welfare Act. 
The disparities in healthcare resources um, between Northern and Southern Nigeria persisted. That was because most of the colonial masters were based in the um, Southern part of Nigeria and the Northern, Northern Nigeria, even till date, the Northern Nigeria is still um, resistant to Western medicine because of the unfamiliarity um, that they were initially exposed to. So after 1960, where Nigerian gained independence in 1960, they iner inherited a fragmented healthcare system from the Brit British with disparities in infrastructure and access to maternal and child health services. Like I previously mentioned, different regions in Nigeria had different kinds of infrastructure. This was not something that was um, universal in the nation. This was not something that when they were um, developing a, a particular part of the country, they neglected some other parts of the country. So this led to them inheriting a fragmented health care. The post-colonial development initiatives tried to focus on health and demographic indicators, but challenges um, persisted due to different factors like socioeconomic factors and health care prioritization. Medical services for the general pop um, population remains a lower priority compared to state employees and elites, mirroring colonial era practices, meaning the general population, um, the general population still does not have access to healthcare when you compare to them. Uh, when you compare them to individuals that are in the working class, the individuals that have jobs are the people that um currently have health insurance, because that's for the universal healthcare um coverage in Nigeria. One of the requirements is for you to have a job because it is provided to you through your job. Today, the infant's uh, mortality rates is influenced by various factors, um, including um, maternal health, child-related aspects, the socioeconomic status of the mother and her family, sociocultural influences, um, and the utilization and the awareness of um, healthcare services. While for maternal mortality, this um, the maternal mortality is influenced by factors such as hypertension, sepsis, hemorrhage, anemia um, during pregnancy, and um, HIV. So to just recap um, all I've said, there was there is limited historical documents um, for pre-colonial era. Traditional medicine, including herbalists and midwives, were the ones predom uh, that predominantly um, predominant in pre-colonial era in Nigeria. Colonial medicine initiated in the 19th century aims to combat tropical diseases, but this was segregated um, along racial lines. Post-independence Nigeria um, is still a work in progress. They are yet to achieve um, the global, the SDG, SDG um, global um, requirements. If you look at this second um, bar chart, this shows the current um, maternal mortality between 2010 and 2020. In the US, the maternal mortality rate is between 20 and 30, but right now in Nigeria, it is still over a thousand. So that is very high. So for my recommendation, I'm recommending that there has to be more data collection and analysis so that they can um, access areas, so they can identify areas that needs more, um, more um, focus. They need to improve as access to healthcare in rural areas and remote um, areas. They need to engage the community through health education because a lot of people, like um, especially in the north, are still not comfortable with um, Western medicine. So while combining while combining um, traditional medicine and Western medicine, they need to be educated as to the importance of this. And we need to also add for advocate for policies that prioritizes maternal and infant health, addressing social determin determinants of health, and foster collaboration between um, stakeholders. And you can scan the square code for my references. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We do have a couple of minutes um, or questions, if there are any. And then we'll head back to the main room. You can ask a question from, from any of our presenters, if you have any. If you do not, 
feel free to um, exit the breakout room and head back to the main session. I have a question for Kyle. Um, I was wondering how you balance um, interventions for diseases like sarcopenia, which seems to be in need with our rapidly aging population, and then the unattended consequence of something like muscle uh, dysmorphia, um, because the intervention typically is progressive resistance training. Great question. I'm I'm not sure Kyle is in front of his computer at the moment. <laughs> That's what I'll try to follow him up, follow up with him at some other point. He's at University of Buffalo, right? 